Hello, Dot Next. How are you doing? Um, I, the, the, they already presented me, but I'm going to talk to you about how to achieve high performance C sharp, just buttering C sharp enough to not being able to recognize it as C sharp anymore. Uh, the idea behind this talk is to actually show you the kind of performance improvements you can actually get when you need them. But it's definitely not something that you're going to be able to use on general, uh, on general problems out there. You have to have very specific use cases to be able to uh, be successful with this kind of techniques. Uh, my name is Federico Andres Lois. I, I am also the um, founder of Corvalius. What we do is research and development. And we have been working with our, one of our most demanding clients, which is a database engine. So we have been working on optimization for four years already. If you think about this, uh, this is more or less the amount of time you had to have been optimizing a single product to be able to use this kind of techniques. Because it is, very, uh, it is very important to actually figure out where your bottlenecks are, to be able to understand how your software is behaving on almost every, uh, every metric. So every, everything that I'm going to talk to you about here, you can actually look samples on this uh, GitHub repo, where there's not only these examples, but there are, uh, there are others. So let's start with uh, some simple math. What happens if tomorrow, after coming to this great um, conference, your boss said, OK, now, now you know a lot of, about performance, so we want you to design a system that is able to process 20 billion operations per day. I'm going to take a second, so you can sink in this number. OK. You're crazy, right? We're not going to achieve this. But the thing is, when you start digging deeper, you can think of this about 20 billions over 24 hours sustained. We're not about peak performance. We're going to, about, uh, to talk about sustained performance. So now the number, it's more or less better, right? No, really no. So we can just try to narrow it down a little bit, like say, OK, how much do I have to process per minute? So the number kind of gets something that you can actually count. Yeah, really. So you, kn you know where I'm going, right? So we're talking about roughly 20, 200k operations per second. What can an operation be? Whatever you like it to be. So this is how we typically solve this kind of issue. <laughs> no, not really. This is a number we can all understand. We can actually count this. But typically what we do is like this. <laughs> so. Now we have something. We can work with this. So if you think about it, this is like a big number, but it no, it's not so big. Because if you think about it, you can dedicate an entire machine, an entire node, five milliseconds, one after another, and you can get something like this. Five milliseconds per operation, per second, per node. So if you think about it, we make games with budgets of 13 milliseconds. So we, are, we, we, we have something to work with. So the interesting thing here is when you are optimizing, typically what you see in the wild, and I mean most systems out there, this is a long tail distribution, are able to process in sustain than 600 requests per second per node. Where's the trick, you may ask? So you can have requests that are this small, tech, tech Empower benchmark, 
when you just return a single, um, a single uh, return every single time the same thing, or you can have this thing that is going to send messages all over the, wor all over the world and doing whatever, and definitely it's not the same thing. But the thing is, for a data, from a database point of view, if you are going to have 600 sustained requests per second per node, I have to plan, sorry, I have to plan for 6,000. And the thing is that planning for 6,000 requires a different and a different, entirely different engineering effort than planning for 600. So on 600, you can actually be reactive about performance. You actually don't, do not need to have like, oh, we have this team of performance guys that are going to come here and say, this is wrong, do it again. No. You just, oh, fuck, what I do here? <laughs> so these 600, these 600 guys can actually go and, and go and measure and say, okay, fine. These are the 600 that we need. Oh, and you know what? This method sucks. And you can just go to that method, just figure out what is wrong, fix it, on voila, 3x. Or whatever you need. Essentially, we have seen even more. But on 600, you actually need a, a, you actually need a plan. You actually plan for 600 requests per second. You actually need someone that is actively looking, that it's looking that nothing that gets into the code is going to hurt those 600 uh, sustained requests per second. But it doesn't end there. Eventually, you hit that. But the very same techniques that take you there are not going to take you there. Two orders of magnitude difference, it's going to be hard. Um, for that, you have to cheat, and you have to cheat a lot. So essentially, what I'm, what I'm going to show you is how we teach, uh, how we cheat. So you know, I'm, I'm using the multiplicative. So I can say this metric unit, the 10, 10 next metric units, and 100. But this works on the lesser is better too, just divide it. So I'm going to tell you what this talk is not going to be about. We are not going to talk about interrupts, uh, or the cost of interrupt, or that allocations are bad, or that you don't have to use. You, no, actually, you, it's not that you don't have. You cannot use try-catch. You cannot use link. Uh, if you allocate on this code path, you are crazy, and in the bad way. So. There are many, many optimizations that you can perform, but your code path has to be so lean that being able to handle that, it's going to be a major engineering effort. We are also not going to, take, uh, going to talk about how we can take advantage of several uh, technologies are, that are currently available on many compilers, including the chassis time compiler in, uh, in CoreCLR. So we are not going to talk about the side effects that inlining has on your call sites. We are not going to talk about the collateral effects that uh, certain optimizations have. We are going to talk about how, after we know all this, we can still cheat. So to be able to understand where you are, it's always better trying to be able to name that. So this is essentially what we did in our work. We, we just figured out based on empirical evidence. So there's nothing published here. There's no field paper that you can uh, go to. It's just how it looks that it happens to us. Your uh, my, uh, mileage may vary. So when we're talking about uh, our Pareto rule, I, everybody knows Pareto rule, right? So we are talking that Roughly 20% of the code consumes 80% of the resources. And that sounds about right. But then we can square Pareto. So we're going to square the left side, and we're going to square the right side. These are less than one numbers, so instead of going up, they're going down. So when we are talking about Pareto square, we are talking about Roughly 4% of your code actually consumes a little bit of more than half uh, your resources, roughly 
one third, sorry, two thirds. But we can square, uh, we, can, we can multiply it again, so we get Pareto cubed. We are talking about here of about 0.8% uh, of the code. In a one million code base, that's roughly 5,000 lines of code. So it's actually quite manageable. So the interesting thing about this is we can now put many, many of the stuff that we use, uh, we are used to optimize in a nice bucket. And this is what I like about being a programmer. We always want to put things in buckets. So on the, higher, on the upper level bucket, we are going to put stuff like your architecture, your network, your algorithms. And with algorithms, I'm talking about order. I'm talking about big O. On the next level, it's typically what the typical techniques that work are those techniques that are at aim at algorithm time. How to avoid doing more than once what you can do once. At Pareto Cube, the thing gets nasty. This is where you are actually cheating a lot. So now that we know this, the problem is this is where our bottlenecks lie. So if, you, if your system is below a certain level of optimization, you don't care about the, two, the, the other two. Just focus on this one. Because getting 60x performance improvements, just focusing on this one, it's, it's, it's not something that it's far-fetched. So I'm going to talk to you about a little bit of what our particular um, bottlenecks were two versions before. So RibbonDB is an entirely managed uh, document database that at the time of 2.0, we, we, uh, we, were, uh, we were using as a storage engine Ascent from Microsoft, which is a very good database. But the problem was that every time that I have to store something, I had to go and do an interrupt. And those, we know, are costly. So these were our bottlenecks. So we weren't doing enough batching. Batching is like the very first technique that you will use to help, to help the upper ones. Um, we were doing a lot of hashing. We are talking about cryptography hashing. We, do, we did a lot of uh, JSON processes, processing. So we set up to optimize the 2.0 code base. And we said, OK we have this problem with interrupt. We just build our own storage. We build our own storage. Everything all right. No way. We just introduced two different new bottlenecks down the line. And we just say, we are going to batch. Yeah, again. We are going to make JSON processing better. OK, it was not good enough. So. All these things, the only thing that did was change where our bottlenecks are. Even though this, you, you, we actually got 10x improvement on critical path, which is a lot. So from 3.0 to 4.0, actually we take the other route. We say, OK, let's forget about this. Let's start over. Let's start from the very basic, and let's design performance first. I don't care what the client wants. I want performance first. So we started working with things like specialized local memory allocators. Um, we built our own string. Guys, that shouldn't, shouldn't be done. We also design our own binary serializations format that ensure that we are not copying information. So we can just get this bunch of memory and just do whatever we want with it. We also implemented our own versions of uh, algorithms especially tuned for the particular case of data that we were storing. We focus on how to manage the I/O and memory access patterns. So we, are, we have to tell the kernel, OK, kernel, step, wait, this particular page in memory, I'm going to use it. Do not take it out. 
or, hey, I'm going to use the next two. So bring it on. So making sure that every, everything works, it's like being tuning small different things. And, and most of the time, the improvement is uncertain until you try it and you measure it. But the interesting thing about the performance improvements is they multiply. So it's not the same thing to actually achieve 2x than to actually achieve 4x. Because if you actually achieve 2x, achieving 4x, it's actually doubling it again. And probably the most important thing that we did in this code base re um, rewrite was actually removing all of I'm, I'm not going to say all. I, I still have a few nasty ones that I want to tackle, but I can't. Uh, virtual calls. So whenever your virtual calls are killing you is when you know we, you have to go back to this kind of playbook. So from all the bottlenecks that we have in 3.0, I'm going to concentrate on these three. And why? Because, well, <laughs> they are manageable for an hour. <laughs> so we are going to make a simple assumption. This is, and actually, this is not a post-mortem assumption. This, is, this was actually an assumption when we started the project. And it was, we served requests. We start a request, and then it ends. Simple as that. It, there's, there's no magic here. But the thing is, when you think about this assumption, it has many uh, interesting, um, interesting things that are going to start cropping up. Like, for instance, if we measure allocations under this model, you can find that for each request, what dominated, and I mean by far, I say 90% of the allocations were like strings. We are, we are a database. We deal with strings. And on the next, down there in the line, we're actually talking about collections, objects that we create that are going to be reclaimed on gene zero, so st stuff that is far and forget. Also, way down there, the uh, async machinery, uh, so when you have to do an await, you're essentially allocating. It's not much, but it adapts pretty fast. And also the lambda capture context. So to get in rid of allocations, and this was around the end of 2015, we actually decide, OK, that's great. We are dealing with memory when we have to go to the disk. What's the other thing? Let's just go and get rid of it. And now we have our own uh, uh, unmanaged strings that we can straight right from the disk. So we have to work around who is the owner of this memory type of questions, or I'm go how fast I'm going to allocate, or what's the typical density or the size of our strings that we are going to allocate. So we tune our unmanaged strings to actually be able to have frequent, high frequency allocation for small strings, which, is, which was our typical case. On most cases, you are not being able to know this if you haven't had your product already pretty lean because your bottlenecks are going to prevent you from knowing this stuff. The other thing, and this is, uh, uh, sorry, uh, sorry. Uh, one of the important things here is that this is a Pareto one decision. This is something that it's going to ripple across your entire architecture. This is not something that it's a light decision to make. For this to happen, we have to decide, okay, we are going to start over and there's not going to be any binary compatibility between versions that introduce a lot of issues. So another Pareto, um, Pareto thing that we found is that we are now able to pull by request because if request gets executed in the same thread, memory, it's already going to be hot. So if I have been using this memory from the strings, then I reuse that very same memory from the strings that processor already has that memory uh, probably near in the cache lines. 
a Pareto two uh, decision was like, okay, in, I, there are cases where request is not enough. Uh, we can't do it in request, but there, there's a better approach, which is, okay, I don't want to deal with having to pass this context every, every single line up to the bottom. So we say, okay, for these kind of things, we are going to use general pools. So if you get, if you get an object that has been used on a different processor, okay, we're fine. It's, it, it's, it's not that hard. And a micro-optimization thing that we did on this is like, we avoid the stack allocation, uh, we avoid, sorry, heap allocations like the plague. So when you are designing high-performance software, the very best thing that you can do for your garbage collection, a collector, is not needing him. So I'm going to talk a little bit about our byte string, because we're going to use a string. It's already taken. So our byte string has sort of this form. We had some flags, that's a byte. Uh, the length of the actual string, uh, the unmanaged pointer to the memory, to the actual memory that holds this byte stream, and also the size of the, of the allocated segment in case I have to return it back for being reused. Not much different from C++ string, right? It also sounds familiar to something that we do have on CoreCLR which is a span. This was introduced uh, early, early 2016, but it really got mainstream right now. But the idea here is what you have, a reference to a type. What's a reference? It's a pointer. It's a very well-designed and very, very, very uh, hidden pointer, and the length. But the thing is that we needed unmanaged memory. We cannot do this. So by stream, it's essentially an expand-like but legal C-sharp construct. So this thing has a problem. This is 36 bytes. That means that whenever I have to move a byte string, passing it as parameter or returning it as a return as a function call. I'm going to be copying 36 bytes. You know, assembler, how big a register is? Eight bytes, that's a long. How big the common uh, biggest register that we have, we are the um, uh, SMID um, registers, 32 bytes. So we are in trouble. Passing these guys as parameters is going to be troublesome. We cannot do it. The things that we win for, in, for being able to handle this, this stuff, we are losing it, passing it as parameters. But this is not something that other communities have, haven't solved before. If you come from Z and C++, how would you fix this? like we fix everything in computer science, adding another level of interaction. So what we did? Pointer to a structure. So now, how big our byte string is in memory? Eight bytes. Nice. But a question remains. And it's, how much does really, really, really cost passing this as a parameter? So the better, the better way to figure this out is to actually do the experiment. This is what everybody in the performance uh, field do. We experiment. So let's say that we have this. We are taking a byte string, A, and we are just returning it, essentially nothing. We are just telling the uh, just-in-time compiler that you are not 
allowed to enlarge. We want this method to be called, to actually understand what's the cost. And because we know it's eight bytes, right? The new implementation, because it's a pointer. So what can we compare it to? A long, which is eight bytes too. So I implemented a simplified version of our byte string that it essentially does nothing. But it's good enough, a proxy, for the actual thing. And whenever you create one of these guys, you are essentially going to, uh, to assign the pointer, and that's it. So we're going to start here. This is, this is a very simple thing. We are going to get along from a field, an static field, and we are going to call our function. And to avoid the just-in-time compiler to just kill everything because there's no side effect, we are going to, uh, to write to the console to force uh, the just in time to for the just in time compiler not being able to optimize this code. And we get something like this. I didn't ask, are you prepared to see assembly? <laughs> okay, here we have. First move, we are getting stuff straight from memory into our RCX register. And we are calling a function. Now you may realize. RCX is the first parameter. So we are going to call that method, and then we are going to copy from the RAX to the RCX. You get it right. RAX is where the functions are returned. And then we are going to do a call, which is our write line. So good luck. JIT just that didn't get rid of our code. And now we're going to do exactly the same. We're going to get our pointer. We are going just to create it. We are going to call our method. And we, for the purpose of this, we are just going to uh, do a cast just to, for the console line to be uh, friendly with us. And when you look at the code, essentially, we are going to do a mob to the uh, move operation to the RCX. We are going to call the function. We are going to go to the RAX, and we're going back to copy that to the RCX to call yet another function. Sounds interesting, right? And this is because there's actually no difference at the just-in-time compiler level between these two entirely, semantically entirely different pieces of code. So I think you know where this is going, but wait for it. Because we're going to see something else that is going to be paired with this to make our life, our life not easy to read code, by the way. We are going to talk about a pretty nasty trick that the just-in-time compiler uh, played with us. And, it start, and the story starts like this. Let's say that we have this nice um, interface, I marker, which is empty. And we make these two, particularly two, uh, two implementations, which is marker I and marker J. And the interesting thing here is that we are going to put a struct in there instead of a class, as we would always do. So not much a difference, right? Well, not exactly. Let's say that we build this simple code. This is pretty boilerplate. I just call a method. It gets a parameter t. If the marker is marker a, we just return a. If the, if the parameter is not marker a, it's going to return g. Simple? Everybody follow up to here? So what's this goal? What the just-in-time compiler looks, when, when it looks at our code, what she looks? She looks something like this. She says, OK, this is method. And this method is, has a parameter, which is marker i. 
So, yeah, it's an eye marker. The constraint is true, so I'm going to continue. I have no need to know about the constraint anymore. And it's going to do this interesting, to say the least, comparison, which is, okay, marker i, it's equal to marker i? Yeah. No question. But the thing is that because marker i is not struct and it's not a class, it's able to figure out that there's no way this thing can change. So the actual code that gets emitted is this. Same exercise. We do the same with marker G. So now what we get? Marker G, it's equal to marker A? Mm, I don't think so. So we essentially wrote two co entirely different copath using a simple, uh, a simple trick. So the question is, why should we use genetic metaprogramming? For those that come from C++, same reasons, okay? No questions asked. For those that are not, well, it essentially allows us these interesting behaviors. We can actually get rid of virtual calls on high frequency calls. So you have something that it's a virtual call and you want to get rid of it, you can just play, in a, play in along with these kind of tricks to actually get rid of those virtual calls. You can actually tailor algorithms based on how you plan to use them. Think about an allocator. Oh, this allocator is high frequency. Oh, this allocator is not going to return the memory. And I'm fine with it. We also can exploit other optimization behaviors of the just-in-time, because essentially, now the just-in-time says, oh, all this is fixed. So now I can do constant propagation. And also, the interesting thing is that we can avoid any invariant conditional. So someone are going, some are going to say, but the CPU can't predict the branch, right? Yeah, but better than, having to, uh, than a branch predictor is not having to branch at all. So I'm going to show you a use case for it, so you can actually can get a sense of it. Let's talk about object pools. So an object pool, the typical object pool is, OK, I have a pool, I have a type, I have objects, we're done. But actually, our objects do live. So we can actually create them, and they, are, they can actually be recla reclaimed. And when you are dealing also with unmanaged memory, you have to actually do it by yourself. There's also other interesting things, like for instance, you can say, okay, I want to keep these objects especially uh, tailored for this particular processor. So if the last time I got this object from processor one, I want it to be kept at that, uh, at that budget, budget as soon as possible. So I return it, oh, this was from process one, put it in there. Process two comes, no, get this one. Process one comes again, oh, 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 get this one. So a typical allocator that we use today would look something like this. We have an object pool with non-thread aware behavior or processor aware behavior, and we just pass a function telling the, okay, this is how you create this object. Simple. And the trick is here. We are fixing our types. So let's say we compare these two implementations. One is the usual approach. The other one is using an explicit allocator. And the explicit allocator is no more than an extract that also it's going to tell you, oh, you want a new object to, uh, ob object to pull? Just execute new. How do you think this fight is going to be? Even or uneven? 
I kind of gave it up. Come on, guys. This fight is uneven. Using a factory is roughly 1.7 times slower than actually using the new. We are talking about, and think about this, 87 inst uh, return instructions against 57, sorry, 84 until, uh, against 57, which is actual assembler, right? But the question is, should I care about these 27 instructions per operation? So let's do the same exercise with something far more interesting. We can go and implement a dictionary, and instead of having the usual two parameters, we add a third, which is the actual compiler. So now, this is how our typical dictionary would look like if we model it based on these assumptions. So as you see, the I equality compiler, it's an interface. So how our numeric compiler would look, this is pretty simple. We have a struct, which is an I equality compiler long. We get long values. We check, oh, x, is x is equals 2i? Yeah, OK, we're done. Notice the aggressive inlining here. We are explicitly telling to the just-in-time, this is small enough. Just try to aggressive put it in the color, in the color side. So for this, what we did was to actually check if this is true, we actually implement a different dictionary. So what we are going to do is, the first case is our dictionary use exactly the same that the dictionary of uh, .NET works with. The second case is we are, go instead of baking the interface in there, we are going to try to get our numeric equality compiler in there as soon as possible during the load of that particular, that particular uh, type. And then, just for completeness, we are doing the exactly same thing on our dictionary, the core CLR dictionary. So when you check, you get something like this. But the number is like, it really doesn't look like very well. So we're going to go like this. There are differences in behaviors because of the algorithm that the, di the fast dictionary uses. But still, the version that has the numeric equality compiler is more than two times faster than the very same code using the interface. So the question is, OK, these are micro benchmarks. Can we trust them? Can we trust them? No. So what do we do? We test it. In what? Real life. You can see here, the compare actually didn't get in line because it was too big. And still, this is 3.25x better on an actual workload. So, this looks interesting, but how it works? And that is an interesting question, because you may think, oh, I'll do this, and it will just work. No. Just-in-time compiler optimizations are very tricky to get right. Let's see this example. So we have this do dispose, which takes something that the just-in-time just can know at the time of implementing this. But the problem is that unless D is an instruct, she won't be able to know that this is a constant. So the next time when we are going to actually check for that, we will have to actually have the true code path in code, in assembler, and have to deal with it. So. For this purpose, I'm going to say we are going to try to simplify this because I wanted to show you the techniques. But 
you have to be very careful about these kind of deviations because they can they can create they can also be very impactful for your code because you don't you don't know how you are going to be called this is this is up to the user not us the ones that provide this class so let's simplify this now we are going to say okay we have this clear which has this uh, sorry, this bug actually right there, T eviction strategy. We are going to call it um, T eviction instead. So in this case, we know that we have been constructed by a thread aware behavior. So what we are going to be asking here? Oh, you ask me to just liberate all these objects for the gallery collector to be reclaimed. But should I get rid also the ones are, that are hot, that are in my minimal set, that it's hot for each processor? So you can use like lots of different, uh, different alternatives. You can say, okay, if they are longer than one hour, just get rid of them. Or if they have been lived for 15 minutes or they have been idle there for 15 minutes, just get rid of them. I, we are not going to use it anymore. But for the purpose of this, uh, of this example, I'm going to take a different approach. I'm going to say, OK, I eviction of T, can actually, uh, you can actually ask it, do I eviction this thing? And we are going to have two different eviction techniques. One is, get rid of it. We don't care. The other one is, do not ever think about touching this. So as you can see, actually, the implementation is pretty simple. We just return true or false. No questions asked, we're done. So let's say that this is the code of our clear. What we are going to do? We are going to go to this minimal bucket. We are going to get the object. If there's no object, nothing to do here. But if there is, we are going to ask the policy, hey, what do we do here? Do we do we, do we return this or not? In the case of always, this is what the just-in-time compiler sees. Realize that there's no longer a, parameter, a type parameter in the clear. We have a type parameter here. We don't have it here. This is an entirely different code path. In this code path, what we get is an a, fixed reference to always a big strategy of T. So the interesting thing is that the camp a big becomes true because it is a constant. Constant usually get in line even if we don't ask them to. So as it is a true, we, well, there's no reason why I will, ha I will just check and with true. Just get, it, get rid of it. In the case of never a big strategy of T, things is slightly different. What we get there is a false. What happens when this branch is false? Never execute, right. So what we get is this. And what happens when we go and get a reference that is never being used? No reason to acquire it either. And what happens when a method is empty? Holy shit. This code had a problem too. Shit won't optimize this loop. At least not yet. I reported it, so it's, it's going get, to uh, get fixed soon. I hope. So let's talk about a different application of the very same techniques. Let's say that we have highly mitered output uh, directive. So now we have two, no limited and limited. Same technique. We do the same thing about the I table type directive, right? If we are using unsigned inter integers of 32 bits, or we are using unsigned integers of 16 bits. So 
that's how a code looks like. And actually, I have to cut it out because I, had, I haven't had enough space. So I took out several, several of, the, um, of the parameters. So how this works, how the code looks like. By the way, this code, you can actually access it. It is there on the performance repo, and it's also on our code. So you can actually go and look it. In this case, what we are doing is, if we are using one type of, uh, of compression, what we are going to do is we are going to execute the top path. If we are going to use the other one, we are going to use the, the one at the back. If none apply, because someone was funny enough to inject us a different type, sorry guys, I'm throwing. So, you can specialize code to your uses. But there is a, a more interesting uh, example what it, that it's creating zero code facades. And, and this is interesting because now I can go and write an interface, pretty simple one, and write like two different implementations with zero cost. One using streams that you know, everybody knows here that they are slow, right? Because they have, they, most of the, their calls are virtual. So you have to minimize those. And the other one that is going to aggregate that stuff and then it's going to just say, okay, now write all this bunch of memory on the stream. The interesting thing about this is that you can actually start baking these types upwards. And because this is a struct, it gets generated immediately. So you can use it like, for instance, in a new environment. You can just new it. It's there. You don't need anything. You need to use, you, you need to use parameters. You just execute a method. You, you set up a method for construction. So you construct your, your bleedable writer type. OK. Call the constructor of this, uh, of this um, uh, to writer. And you are done. The interesting thing about this is that you can start writing things like this. This is the actual write number implementation after several passes of optimizations. And the interesting thing about this is because this is aggressively inlined, it's going to go upwards and get bakes in on every call site. In this particular case, we don't care if you're actually calling a virtual call if you're actually doing a virtual call to your stream, or you are actually aggregating this byte into a memory, an, an auxiliary memory, and execute. For the upper level, they don't know about it. They don't care for the code that executes this. But the just-in-time compiler, at, at some time, will figure out, oh, these guys are calling me with uh, the efficient guy. OK, so I have to execute this code instead of this one. There are other interesting uses of this, that you can actually hide pointers and references under structs. So the very same thing that we did in this case, you can actually use it for indexing of objects. Now I have my struct, which, is actu which actually has Two things. One is a reference to the pool. The other one is the index where this object is standing. So you can actually do indirections and whatever you can think of using this approach. This is basically what you do when, uh, when you implement an enumerator under a struct constraint. In our case, what we do is OK, we are going to pass a, uh, pass a parameter and be done with it just using this. So the question is, is this really, is really all this work worth the trouble? Well, it actually is. This is like six months ago or so. 
The idea here is we were actually uh, optimizing, micro-optimizing our JSON parser. And to be fair, this was quite optimized at the time. Still, for this workload, JSON parsing was actually 500 seconds. That's roughly eight minutes. So after a first round of optimization using this kind of techniques, we were able to get it to roughly two minutes and uh, three minutes and something. It's pretty good, five minutes less. But the thing is that one week later, we were actually over a little over two minutes. And without wanting it, we actually went down two minutes. So we're talking a difference of Eight minutes execution time, serial execution time, to under two minutes serial execution time. Think if you want to run this on a Raspberry Pi, which has a smaller CPU. It's a net win. It's a net win on a normal CPU. It's an absurd win on those small processors. Think about the power you are not going to spend if you're running this on a big cluster of, say, a thousand machines. And eventually, all HPC stuff ends up in being, how much do I have to pay for it? So what we're talking about here is we got from this technique 6.6x improvement on top of all the improvements that we also had. That's a ton. So putting it all together, we are talking about generic metaprogramming using uh, a stroke wrappers of time. This is essentially, you can, you can do like lots of crazy stuff here. In fact, whenever you find a technique that I didn't talk about, please email me because this is interesting stuff. So the idea here is there are some ideas on uh, the C-sharp uh, committee that they are looking for. The m more or less what, it, what this looks like is like they're defining something that is called shapes and, and extensions, but when you look under the cover on how they intend to implement it, it looks like exactly this very same thing, but back at the C Sharp language itself. So it's allowing this idiom straight into the, into the language, which is now looks like a different language, not C Sharp. So also hiding a uh, pointer on references allows you to do like a lot of stuff. So make sure that if you really, really, really need to apply these kind of techniques, to be very careful about what you do because six months from now, probably only a handful of developers are going to be able to deal with this code. It happens to us. Probably two or three are actually um, know enough about how this works to actually being able to touch it. So one final thought, and, and this is important because for everyone working in performance, there's one thing that you should know, is that bottlenecks do not disappear. They just become harder and harder and harder to get rid of. So I can tell you today what our bottlenecks today and most of them involves the CPU not being able to have the memory in its cache to actually being able to work. So essentially, I can upload 64 gigabytes in under six minutes to a database with seven, using 17% of CPU. So the problem is how do I have better I.O. patterns and how do I, who, how I am sure that every time that the database need to have the memory ready to work with, it has it. So uh, we have lots of work to do. We know we have lots of work to do. Uh, so probably there will be future talks about these kind of tricks uh, in the future. So. Thank you for coming, and I hope you have enjoyed uh, the talk. Oh.
Oh, what? Sorry. One, one more thing. If you want to start, you can just start here. <laughs> just remember, the first link are my commits, and those are not the commits you are looking for, right? You can. Okay. Uh, we have uh, a time for one or two questions. And uh, another question you can ask uh, to Federica in discussion zone. Вопросы? Сзади посмотри, пожалуйста, Леша. Oh. <laughs> uh, hello. So the question is simple, really. Mm, and does the compiler behavior changed when uh, you switched from uh, regular .NET to .NET Core? <laughs> Good question. Quick answer. Yes, a lot. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, so, what do you need to do? Uh, so, uh, uh, no. whenever you change runtime, what do you need to do? Uh, with uh, uh, with this kind of code, that was my question actually. So you have to test again and again and again, and know that you don't have regressions on it. And also, there are other things. New op optimizations are getting are getting uh, included every single time. So, old tricks may work. But there's probably a better way to do it now. Uh, so I'm guessing you probably have some kind of, uh, I don't know, performance test for the uh, for these kind of things. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, thanks for a great talk. Uh, I have a really simple question. Uh, you've talked about struct and lining in your code, and uh, what can you say about the situation when you have few uh, few uh, few generic parameters, w uh, every of uh, which are is a struct, and you have a you know, exponential growth of memory taken by the by the code uh, which resides in uh, JIT cache. So we had a simple situation on, uh, when we used AOT on uh, iOS and Xamarin, and we had uh, some methods that accepted few generic parameters with, which were struct, and the generated amount of code was huge. It was much higher than the normal code base. Have you measured that for your case, and how no, has I it changed? I didn't measure that, but if I got the question right, if I not, let's just tuck it in the, in the discussion sure. area. Mm, I think it was uh, Matt Warren that talked about it like a week ago. You can actually deny of service the just-in-time compiler with a simple construct that is going to take its type and it's going to generate, when, when, when the just-in-time needs to generate that, it's going to enter in a loop. Um, probably you can get like a gigabyte of memory and you just kill it. Roslyn and, and, and the just in time compiler, both. Uh, the question was actually about the amount of memory taken by JIT cache when the application runs. So it has to generate the code for every, every struct. Mm -hmm. When we use reference types, we generate just one code, right? One. And for struct, we should generate for every time. Did the memory footprint for that increase? Oh, you haven't measured? Not measurable yet. Okay, thank you. Друзья, спасибо. Uh, у нас uh, кончилось время. Все остальные вопросы вы можете задать в дискуссионном зоне. Yeah? One, okay. one, one little thing, by the way. The just-in-time compiler is freaking awesome. It just can get, uh, it just can do like these amazing things. I haven't hit yet a case when you can actually, uh, not on purpose, of course, um, being the source of your issues. It's typically on your source. Thank you.